Hello and welcome to Drawn Out Conversations, the series where I get a chance to talk to other engineering leaders about the technology they use and the architectures they've built in order to scale and grow their organizations. Today I'm joined by Hector Aguilar, President of Technology of Okta. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. I know that most people do know, but for anybody who doesn't, can you just tell me at a, at a high level what it is that Okta does? Sure, absolutely. Um, Okta is an identity management service um, with a cloud service. And what we do is mainly two things. We have our workforce product, which allows you to connect to the applications that you need to use every day to do whatever you do. Um, and the other product is the platform product, which is a way that you can use our Okta APIs to um, handle your users and connect to uh, basically custom built experiences for your users. But it's basically authentication, identity management, that's what we do. Got it. Well, so CircleCI is an Okta customer. Uh, Great. And so I know a little bit. You like bit. the product? It's fantastic. It's, awesome. Uh, my team is definitely, it's saved a lot of people a lot of time in, in managing onboarding and offboarding and, and all those things that, uh, cool. that nobody really wants to spend their time doing, for one, and, and two, uh, we all know are very important. Um, so it's been great for us. Awesome. And, and the thing that I realize is I can't do my job on any given day without Okta, without Okta um, you know, participating in that flow as, yep. I, as I connect myself to the various applications that we yep. use. We're a, we're a provider of cloud services. Most of the capabilities that we have to support mm -hmm. our organization yep. are provided as cloud services and therefore connected through Okta. So everyone is very dependent on it. And it really needs to be in the background. Yeah. So uh, can you maybe just walk us through a little bit what the flow looks like? So I yeah. show up in the morning yeah, 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 and yeah. I need to start using, I don't pick any application that I use, but let's say, uh, well, I don't know. I'm try it's so funny because I want to talk about using like uh, Git and writing software. But yeah, I, absolutely. I don't get to do that anymore. So uh, let's say I need to make a Google slide. Sure. <laughs> what does that flow look like? Oh boy. So this is where I get to draw right. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start, let's say, with a client. So let's say you have a little laptop here, mm -hmm. little laptop, and then um, you're trying to access, I don't know, let's say, um, yeah, Google Docs, right? So the first thing that's going to happen is that you're going to open a connection to our Okta service, and I'm going to use the Okta Blue. Perfect. And so um, we're a cloud service, right? So I'm going to put a wow, big cloud here. Most and of then, the cloud. <laughs> that's Congratulations. Correct. Thank you, thank you. So, and then you basically enter with um, a layer that, that, that we basically call a router. Mm -hmm. That routing layer is gonna connect you to one of the different environments and services that we have. And all of these things uh, we call cells. Okay. And so each cell is a bunch of servers, a collection of servers and, and services and databases. And each of those cells can handle millions of users, thousands of customers, okay? We are mm -hmm. a highly multi-tenant system that is backed by a bunch of um, services and, and a bunch of databases. Um, so the routing layer is gonna basically route you to where you are, mm -hmm. okay? Um, after that, you're gonna send maybe your username and your password. Uh, let's say you send your username and your password. This thing is gonna resolve it. Not gonna go, uh, let's assume this is, this is Octomaster, meaning that we can authenticate you. Yeah. We say yes. We say yes. Then um, at that point, there is policies that get evaluated. And mm -hmm. so let's say you needed to use some multi-factor authentication. Okay. Which means that let's say we want to send you an SMS to authenticate. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So if that happens, and I'm going to use a different color, um, then we're going to talk to a third-party service, mm -hmm. which is also a cloud service. Uh, that is an SMS provider. Okay? okay. That SMS provider is going to talk to the cellular network, right? Um, whatever that is. I'm, so, I'm a Verizon right. customer, so okay, this, this okay. can be well, Verizon. Verizon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then that ends up sending a message to your iPhone or Android device. My my phone is almost as big as I, I think. This is actually true. It's an iPad. Right? It's an this iPad. Is, this is like a it's an iPad. Or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, okay. uh, it's it's a Samsung Fold. Okay, perfect. There you go. Yes, because I am on the cutting right, edge. Right, right. Correct, correct. Perfect. And so then you get your, your text, and then you basically type it in. This basically verifies that you're who you are. And then at that point, you get an Octa session. Woohoo! Now you have wow. an Octa session. Yep. What can you do with that Octa session? Well, at that point, you're going to have uh, the third party service that you want to access. So let's say you have 
Google. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so you want to access that. And so now, when you try to access Google, then Google is going to tell you, well, you know, to access that document, you actually need to get a token from Okta. Mm -hmm. So that goes back to you saying, hey, you actually need to go to Okta to get your session token. So you go to Okta. Mm -hmm. Okta says, well, you know, I know who you are. You have been already authenticated right. with all MFA. And then it sends you a SAML assertion. You present that SAML assertion to Google. Google says yes. It returns the session. And now you can actually use Google. Got it. That's basically when everything goes well. And so there's Got a it. lot of things. There's a lot of complexity here. I'm not going into all of the microservices and everything that is happening here. But at the end of the day, that's part of our mission to make sure that authentication is seamless to you. All of this happened by you clicking on a document. You are authenticated, you got the SMS, you go into your Google document. And after that, every other service that you're going to use that is in your Okta dashboard works basically seamlessly. You don't have to authenticate ever again. You just click on it, this right. kind of SAML communication happens magically, and then you're in. Got it. I love that it's seamless with these however many lines there yes, are there. Yes, you don't yeah. see any of those yeah. connections. Uh, so we, it's part of our job to hide that complexity. It is complex. Uh, there's a lot of security tokens. There is a lot of encryption that is happening behind the scenes, but uh, that's what we do. So there's just on this diagram yes. already a few additional parties, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, so I, I would assume, given what you do, that you spend a lot of time sort of connected into or, or managing connections into other systems, stuff Correct. like that. And also, as I mentioned before, when I get to the office in the morning, uh, actually, before I get to the office, as soon as I start working, mm -hmm. um, authentication needs to work yep. for me to do anything. Absolutely. So I would imagine that you spend a lot of time and energy on the reliability of this system. Correct. Um, and so I'm curious if, if there are specific points that are maybe interesting or surprising about um, where you've had to put a lot of energy into making sure things are really, yeah. really reliable. That's a super important point. Um, the reality is that sheet? yes, um, right. we 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 tend to we, we think about ourselves as as an infrastructure company, uh, basically as a utility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you want power, you are internet, you want Okta. Like yep. that has to be there, because if it's not there, it really ruins your day. Not mm -hmm. only my day, but it also ruins your <laughs> day, right? Uh, certainly would ruin my day, but. Um, so in order to do that, I mean, I show you everything that happens when things go, go well, uh, but we can just go through basically a similar um, image for when things are not going that great. So again, we start with, with your laptop, um, and then uh, you connect again to the Okta service. And if we basically do a little bit of a zoom in into one of these cells, you basically have a bunch of load balancers mm -hmm. here, and all of these things are connected like this. And then back on those load balancers, there's a bunch of servers that are behind those load, ba load balancers, right? Mm -hmm. And so all of this is basically like almost like a like a, a cross product of right. everything that, right. that is happening there. And all of this is backed by different uh, availability zones or data centers, okay. so basically different distributed systems, right? And then in here you have databases that are actually replicated here, and these things are basically talking like this as well. That's very nice, right? Yeah. And so what happens? <laughs> well, there's, there's happens a lot of redundancy in here. There's that a lot I, that of much redundancy. I can see, yeah. There's a ton of redundancy. And, and one of the things that we do is that when you basically send your credentials to authenticate, let's say at that point we detect that one of these servers is not working. Mm -hmm. Within that, what we do is basically redirect it to another layer so that at least your authentication works. Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, we're really just an authentication engine. You know, we do many, many things. We do provisioning, we do kind of like SMS, we do MFA, we do, uh, we do kind of one-time password. But at the end of the day, we are an authentication factory. We, yeah. That's what we do. That's yeah. basically, if there is one API, it's the Authent API, right? Yeah. We need to make sure that that thing works. Okay. And we spend a lot of time making sure that when you're authenticating, we're monitoring all of our servers, we're monitoring the, our databases. And for example, we have replication on our databases. If one of our databases is slow, we're going to redirect you within um, kind of that authentication that is happening to another database. Okay. So at the end of the day, I mean, for people that, that have experience with cloud, you know that the reality is that anything can fail in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. Server can disappear, a, a disk drive could, could or, or a virtual a hard drive could, could, could 
could become slower, the network could fail, um, a routing layer could fail, anything could fail. Yeah. And the reality is that at Okta we have spent a lot of time um, understanding failure modes and making sure that architecture can um, kind of work around all of these things immediately. One, one thing that I've said about this for a while actually is that as like I, I like the way you just said it if mm -hmm. you've worked in the cloud which most of us have. Most Correct. Of us, well most of us here have. Right. I can't Not speak for anybody watching world, this. But, but, yeah, yeah. Um, Work in the cloud, it's awesome. Yeah, so when you have that experience, you start to architect your systems a little bit differently yeah, with the expectation yeah. that things are gonna fail. Yep. But the reality of this situation is things used to fail in data centers also. We just, we never really got our heads around that. Mm -hmm. And now we're all building systems the way we should have built systems right. all Correct. along. Correct. Uh, but those patterns have emerged and more, more of us have shared those patterns yeah. about how to build things. Yeah. So I think that's actually been a really great evolution for, uh, for, for architecture and software design. Okay, so. And I think to your point, in the past, when we had on-premise services, we had the illusion of control. Right. Like, we, we thought that we controlled them. And now, right. that illusion is gone. Like, we know we don't control the system. Right. So we need to be more conscious about how we design. We think much more about resilience yep, in a way that we, we always absolutely. should have. OK, very cool. So, uh, so that's kind this of initial part. request, lots of bits of, right, right, right. of redundancy then, in here. And, and you said there's failover here. I assume this happens across these AZs. Yeah. If, and if, if this thing goes away, we'll redirect it to another one. And we usually over provision. So even if two of these things go away, we still have enough capacity for you. Wow. So that works. Yep. Now, once we actually say, OK, now we evaluate the policy, we say, OK, we, you, we need to send you an SMS, right? And so in my previous um, kind of picture, I said, well, now we need to talk to an SMS provider, mm -hmm. right? So this is the SMS provider. And the SMS provider needs to talk to, um, I don't know, Verizon, right? Mm -hmm. And then that needs to talk to your Samsung Fold. So now, the interesting thing is that let, let's say you're traveling to a, a country where Verizon is not, is not there, okay. right? you're roaming, right? Yeah. One of the things that we learned um, just as, as we were building the system is that the relationship between the SMS provider and the cell providers is, is different, right, in different countries. And so let's say you're, you're using X provider here um, that is not Verizon. And let's say this SMS vendor doesn't have a great relationship with them. So, so let's say we send you the text and then you never got the text, right? So what happens is that you never get the text that has the one-time code that you need to put in so that mm -hmm. we do multi-factor authentication. And so you never get the text, well, you know how to authenticate. So the way we do that as well is that we need to make sure that we have built redundancy also for third parties that we use. And so the way we do that is that when you say that you want to retry, we basically know that, hey, we send you a text, but you never got it, and that's why you want to retry. And so what we do is that we say, you know what, maybe this SMS provider is not working. And so what we do is we actually talk to an alternative SMS provider. And then hopefully that SMS provider is going to have a better relationship with Verizon, and now you're going to get the text, and now you're going to be able to basically complete the circle. The interesting thing is that over time we have learned that this could actually vary depending on where you are and depending on, on or who, who your carrier is and, and, and what vendor are, we, are, we are using. Yeah. And so we'll do dynamic routing and then we'll remember that, hey, for this person, this user, this country, this is a better provider. Let's say this is SMS1 and this is SMS2. And then we'll basically tie that into your uh, identity. And we will keep that until we detect that things are breaking again. And I we'll just move it to, a, to another provider. And this happens with any system that we use. I really like it's like crowdsourced reliability exactly, information. Exactly, like you know, exactly. because there are parts out in this chain you don't know that there was success. Exactly. Right? We need to use some heuristics. So to someone know. will tell you effectively mm -hmm. by and not send in a support ticket, but just press a button that mm -hmm. says, "Hey, by the way, this part of the chain is broken. Right. Let's do something about it." And then the way you describe this. It's interesting. It reminds me a little bit about uh, or of the model of circuit breakers in yep. the small, yep. which is not only do we not use that connection right now, but we recognize that connection is broken. We flag it for all Verizon customers, maybe at the moment, and then later we'll come back and give it. Do you sort of give it a slow, progressive try? Yep. Like let's route one yep. of these through here. Yep. Did it go? Okay, great. Maybe mm -hmm. we can put some more traffic through there. And, and, and yes, absolutely yes. And actually, one of the things I mean, talk about cloud services. Think about if this thing is happening like hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of times, right? Yeah. And so we know everything that is going on. And so we can actually detect when, for example, an SMS provider is not working 
great. And so we're basically preemptively route people to different providers right. based on what we understand of what, what's happening in the network. So either you can do the switch on a per user level, or we can say, you know, we're seeing a lot of people that are retrying this provider. Might as well do it preventively and switch yeah. to another one so they don't have to retry. And, you know, and then we'll see that retry is kind of coming down because yeah. we're monitoring this maniacally, right? Uh, because for us, once a customer finds, kind of gets a bad experience and reports it, at that point we failed. I mean, right. we have to detect it before it, it becomes an annoyance for the customer. Otherwise, kind of like, we, we really failed. Yeah. Well, I think a uh, retry, I, I appreciate that you think of that as a failure, but a retry to send that text message, which maybe takes a minute, right. is probably acceptable, within the acceptable bounds, the, okay, now I can't get the text and I can't get in and I can't do my job at all, like that, I can imagine how that balloons very quickly. Correct. The frustration of yeah. the customer if they can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you mentioned monitoring maniacally out at this level. Right. I can only assume that extends inside of all, yep. all of these components. Yep. So um, tell me a little bit about the, one, one thing that I'm always interested in is the, the highest level metric, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Meaning, if one of these four things is out of line, then we know we need to go a layer down and a layer down. Right. Does that right. make sense? And yeah, so absolutely. I'm curious if there's like a, a top level thing, the thing that's even on your desk that you know, okay, if these things are in check, then I can sort of go about my daily work. Well, there is, there is the, the piece that we missed here was the actual third party that you actually want to go to, right? Mm -hmm. So Google. Yeah. So all of this was to connect to, basically to get an Okta session, and then this kind of exchange that we were talking yeah. about has to happen for Google. So that's also important because um, one thing that happens is that, let's say Google, Google is a great company. So let's say, let's say company YYY is down. That could also affect your experience because even though you can connect to mm -hmm. Okta, you may go to YYY and then we're not going to, con to, to connect you to it, and then you, you may think that it's Okta. Right. So even we need to, be monitoring all of that so that we can actually let our customer support know like, you know, this particular kind of provider is having problems. So you may get a lot of tickets saying like, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm not able to connect to YYY. The way we do it is we, we also have redundant monitoring. Uh, we use cloud services um, to do log management and monitoring and, and uh, application performance management, mm -hmm. APM and all of that stuff. And we have re multiple of those as well that are constantly looking at our system and all of um, our log system that says, okay, this person was able to send an SMS, this person was able to log into Google, and all of that we're basically sending to, a, to, to, to monitoring systems. Mm -hmm. And then we have heuristics based on, on, on top of that because, um, for example, again, once you get to certain scale, we are not gonna see one or two failures of Google. We're gonna see like hundreds, not Google, but let's say, why, why, why? Um, we're gonna see hundreds of failures. And so we mm -hmm. can actually start building um, analytics to say, okay, you know, typically we see these many, these many failures from that because right. you may have like the right. wrong password, you may not have access to that particular file, but suddenly we'll see kind of a spike like this. Mm -hmm. And so once it reaches a cer certain threshold and we do kind of a lot of heuristics for mm -hmm. that, then that actually calls, um, wakes up the operator. Now the operator, they have a mean time to respond. I think in the last 12, 12 months has been less than a minute. So they see the alert immediately, they're there. But we always have somebody watching. If they don't know what's going on, because they're saying, you know what, we don't know, it might be like why, 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 or Google, or there's, there's some problem there, they will basically call a flare. A flare is basically the operator saying like, you know, this doesn't look good, I'm just gonna call an alarm. Mm -hmm. When they call a flare, we call um, uh, our paging service, and then that basically brings about 20 people. It pages me, it pages a bunch of people, just so that we look, right? And we open um, a, a channel in, in, in um, instant messaging, and we basically start looking to see. And so at that point, there is people in QA that are looking at our log team, uh, mm -hmm. our, our log management. There's people in operations that are looking at the servers. There's people in, from, um, from engineering, and, uh, engineering and, and architects that are basically looking at log entries to see if there is any exceptions or anything like that. Once we detect that there is something that potentially has customer um, impact, then we call a yellow alert. A yellow alert now brings marketing because they're monitoring Twitter, they're monitoring kind of social networking to see if somebody's reporting a problem. And we also call in customer support because they're monitoring across all of our customers to right. see if a lot of customers are detecting that. What, and, and, and once we detect that there is actually customer impact, then we go to red alert. 
When we go to Red Alert, uh, we open uh, uh, what we call a trust post in status.octa.com. So you can mm -hmm. go to status.octa.com, it's open for everybody, and they can see everything that has ever happened. Yeah. So once you go to status.octa.com, at, at that point our mission is that we're going to tell you what's going on, and every half an hour we're going to give you an update of what's going on right. and how are we going to resolve it. And th this could be from an excessive number of retries on SMS, uh, maybe one of our big important apps is basically having problems or our infrastructure may be having right. problems. But it's important for us to have the transparency to, 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 and to show the customers what is going on and what we're doing to resolve it. So no matter where in the system, this whole ecosystem, yep. if, you're, yep. if you believe that your customers are, are going to see an impact, yep. then you're going to, well, that wasn't status.octa.com over here. If right, it's public. You're talking it's about public it. You're and we'll explaining see it. it. Right now, in full transparency, I mean, of course, it's like one or two authentications. We won't post it there. Right. But if it's significant, we'll so say, you know, there's a, there's customers are noticing this. We'll put it, in. and we'll put stuff there where, for example, we had an issue where uh, one of the internet providers was kind of down for like about an hour in parts of the country. Mm. We're actually seeing a lot of requests from customers saying like, Octa is down, Octa is down, and like, we put a status yeah. saying like, you know, we're working, it, but it's really like a third party provider. So try to kind of switch from, I don't know vendor A to vendor B, and you're going yeah. to be able to access us. This is actually very important because we, there, there was um, an incident, you probably remember, in 2015, where there's, there was a big kind of DNS attack. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's also important for us to have multiple DNS providers, right? right. Multiple email providers, multiple SMS providers. Uh, because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter if something goes down. I mean, we're responsible for right. making sure that right. we kind of fail over or, or route around it. Right, exactly. That totally makes sense. And uh, as you can probably imagine, we are also connected into a lot of external of providers course. in terms yeah. of what we do. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so I, I totally get that. I wanted to ask about this because yeah. I think it's a hot topic in, in monitoring right now. Right. Uh, you mentioned when something goes out of band or out, right. of, a, out of a threshold. So the classic, the classic model has been uh, I sit down and I create dashboards and I had asked about sort of those key metrics that you look right. at, like I sit down as an operator or whoever it might be, your SRE team, whoever does this, the engineers and, or the software engineers you themselves. Know, for us it's interesting, I'll, I'll talk about it, but yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'll, well we'll come back to that question, yeah, yeah, though I am yeah. interested. But, um, you know, the, the old model was I make dashboards, I put thresholds, I assign yeah. them myself, and now there's a lot of companies trying to get into this space of anomaly detection. Yep. Yep, yep, so yep, yep. You're, you're dumping in so much data that you can't yep. even possibly know what it is, but we'll tell you if something changes, right. and then you can alert off of Correct. that. And I'm, so I'm curious yep. if you're using that, if you're blending it in, so, sort of how you decide whether you should wake a lot of people up based on that, that seems to be the hot So question. the first thing that is slightly different um, that, that we do at Okta is that the people building the dashboards is actually the QA team. Oh, okay. So the QA team, the SREs, they, they have their own dashboards, but the QA team, I would say, they, they create most of the dashboards. And they're creating also dashboards and also synthetic transactions. So they create some automation that is kind of constantly authenticating, mm, constantly okay. doing SMS. And so they're monitoring that. And they're also they're monitoring thresholds across the different customers. We also have developers um, that are um, in the engineering team writing kind of dashboards that are related to the functionality that they do or the microservice mm, okay. that they develop, right? So all of these things are happening, and sometimes you, you know, you know, if there is more than I don't know, I don't know, ten authentications failing for more than X number of customers, we should probably know about it. We should, we should alert. So there are thresholds that are very clear, right? You can say, mm -hmm. you know, if more than ten customers are not able to authenticate, we should probably know about it, right? Yeah. Where most of so that those can be fixed. So we do that. In addition to that, we do heuristics, and there is a number of log services that really provide different algorithms to do machine learning and, mm -hmm. and, um, and heuristics to detect that. We usually use those for like third-party detection because we don't have enough visibility to know if, for example, I don't know, just mentioning names, uh, let's say Box is having an issue or Salesforce is having an issue or Google is having an issue or Slack is having an issue. We don't have the insight into their system. So mm. on that, that's when really the heuristics and the machine learning, that's where we can thrive. Right. We just basically see, as, as you said, so if, if, we see a, if we see that typically people authenticate this way, right? So basically mm -hmm. this is probably like 9 a.m. Yeah. and PST, and maybe people start working at 7 a.m. and by 9 a.m. is the peak, and then people already have their session, so we start seeing it slowing in that. Yeah. If suddenly we see that you know, authentications drop, then mm -hmm. that's probably something that you want to know, but you don't know right. exactly what number that is. Right. And so that's when we use that, when we are basically trying to look at the unknown, things that we don't really control. Right. But when we know um, how parameters should behave, for example, we know 
and there's always the simple monitoring, the, the CPU, the memory, the data visualization, the number of yeah. queries. We kind of know average what it should be, and any any changes in that we report on. So we could we could be very clear about the the, the, the thresholds there. And we also monitor at the application level. So we're not only monitoring like metrics of like CPU and memory and disk and disk I/O and all of that stuff. We're monitoring that. But we're also monitoring again authentication. So we know right. these many people are authenticating via this MFA and via um, and, and, and from these devices into those applications. And that's basically where we do a lot of our, our, our analysis and basically the, the flare type of analysis. Where we say, right. you know what? It seems like a lot of people suddenly fail to authenticate from this region in the world. Mm. We should be looking at it yeah. to see if it's us or it's them or maybe a server is failing. Um, and then there are some situations where we really take action based on things that may go south before they do. So two questions based on that. You, you talked about both metrics and logging. Yeah. And um, uh, this feels like another hotly debated yep. topic at the yep, moment yep, yep, between, yep. you know, do I break things down and make metrics out of them yep. for my application or yep. do I just log everything, yep. especially structured logging and then totally. use that? Wow, yeah, you and understand so the problem perfectly. I'm yes. curious uh, which of those uh, you pursue and then the other, I'm going to make a note to myself, you talked about regions of the world. Yeah. I'm curious about sort of tags, what dimensions you break down your right. metrics to know, you know, is it external applications, geographies, and what other things yep. are interesting? Yep. So, so everywhere where, where we have sales, we monitor, but we also have pros. We use services for that. We don't have our own pros. So we basically contract yeah. their services to do that, thank goodness, yeah. um, that have all pros. And so we're monitoring performance across the world, right? And so we also set thresholds. So for example, if authentication is taking longer than X amount of uh, milliseconds, then um, will know, right? Yeah. And we want to report to that. So that's basically global performance monitoring. But there is, as you said, there are like really three different things, right? Metrics, logs, and a third one that I'm going to be talking about, which is metrics is um, all of the stuff that, that is around the things that we really know about. Mm -hmm. uh, we know how CPUs behave. We know how our database behaves. Oh and, and we actually know about how our, our authentications behave. And so those we can turn into metrics. So for example, we can say, you know, typically, I don't know, um, a million people log in from this time to this time. Mm -hmm. So if, if suddenly that goes to like 500K, that's a problem. And that could be turned into a metric. But one thing that is, that is a little bit more complex than that is that there are some things where we don't really know. If somebody is mm -hmm. connecting to mm -hmm. a new application that we've never seen before, because you can do that with Okta, you can just create your own kind of template and, and, and connect to an application that we've never seen before. Um, then we're not really going to be able to turn that into a metric very quickly. And so a lot of the, 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 the log management that we do is in the search of the unknown, in, in the search for patterns. And that's a lot of the stuff that, that using uh, not AI, but HI, human intelligence. We basically have the QA team is basically constantly looking at new stuff that customers are doing. Right, right. And then after that, they can turn that into dashboards, alerts, eventually metrics. But to be honest, at least for us, metrics is the last piece that we do because I think metrics is already, you already know what you're looking for. And for mm -hmm. our use case, because mm -hmm. we don't control our world, we don't control all the interfaces and the interactions, first we basically have to figure out what we're looking for. And, that and that's very complex. The, the that comes from logs. We, we do a lot of log management there. We have kind of great tools to do that. Some of the stuff that we have built ourselves, um, but a lot that is kind of out there, cloud services. So you take the logs, mm -hmm. and as you learn from them and say, okay, this is a pattern we need to understand, exactly. then you push that up then into, metrics, into a metric. And, and then maybe and you have some dashboards, but also do this correct. anomaly. And then to correlate, check. right? Because yeah. then we say, for example, now if an alert um, fires from, from a log, then we'll see all of the metrics, like what was the CPU, what was the number of authentication mm. at the time, what was the network, what was the I.O., what were the servers, like were they doing garbage collection? But that's basically to correlate and trying to almost like the movie Beautiful Mind, where you basically put the patterns mm, together. Yeah, I was so going to put ask, all of the patterns and we say, okay, that is what's probably. Are you are you using it. a system that allows you to see those things together, or are you doing the mental math of okay, here's the UTC timestamp, and now I'll go look at the other system and see so, what happens. So so we have um, definitely a lot of people that go to different systems and say, okay, try to look from different angles, and that's mm. basically what happens in, on a flare. There's people that are very familiar with 
system A, there's people that are very familiar with system B. Yeah. And then if you see kind of the, the channel, you'll see people, hey, you know, this is what's happening here, this is what's happening there. And then we basically do almost a human correlation. Yeah. That's one piece. And we have built some scripts that when an alert hits, then we actually go to different systems and put it all together. Oh, wow. So that okay. people can see it. That's something that also we, we wrote. And uh, we have been improving and improving and improving it. Uh, because at the end of the day, it's basically almost automating ourselves because that's what people used to do, right? Anytime there is an alert, you look at the system, you look at the system, you look at that system. Yeah. And if you see a pattern there, you say, oh, this is, I don't know, X thing happening. We've seen right. it before, we know how to deal with it. And then once, actually, once we identify that it's something that could be happening very often, we tend to then go back to the developers and say, you know, you should automate right, right over here. Like, yeah, we shouldn't have to do any, what, what any manual thing, right? right? right, right. So you mentioned a third, you said metrics, logs, and then well, there was a third thing. The third one is heuristics that we do kind of oh, globally across the system, right? And that is, for example, because remember that we are also a security company, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're three things. We are an infrastructure company, we are a, an integration company, and we are a security company, right? right? And on the security piece, that's when it, it becomes much more on the kind of heuristics, machine learning, kind of AI is going to take over the world yeah. kind of technology. Because when, for example, a customer is being attacked, you're going to see that they're testing a lot of usernames and passwords, right? Uh, oh. But if, yeah. if, if they basically, I don't know, bought kind of a, a, or, or, or got a hold of like a number of email addresses and passwords, we're going to see them spraying across multiple tenants. Right. But because we see all of that, yeah. we can actually block not only one thing and what is happening, but basically block across, across the infrastructure. And so there's a lot of more interesting analysis that we do there for, for security. And we have people that are basically looking at it from a HI, but also people that are basically writing the algorithms to detect common things that, that we know happen. This is OctaBlue? And there's OctaBlue. I, I want to draw this. You, all right. you can help me, though. All right. So you're in the middle here. This is thing. I, I, this is a space that I've spent mm -hmm. a little bit of time in, uh, mostly in email, but same yep. idea. Yep. Multiple people re reporting spam into one central exactly. place. Exactly. And then as the provider of that in the center, you have a much, much larger data set Absolutely. to be able to say, uh, oh, we've seen this pattern before, or right. we don't even need to show you that email for exa in that example, mm -hmm. because people from all these other locations, whereas if you just, or, or people from all these other locations have identified it, whereas if it's just you, you're not going to see it. So you're saying as a multi-tenant provider, right, one of these can be us. Correct. Right? Yeah. Or, or that's me, you know, here. Exactly. Or I guess it's not. Sorry, because it's not. Or it could be like, like, a, like a black hat guy. So a hacker. It's, <laughs> perfect. Wait, wait, wait. Um, yes, exactly. Make it angry. Okay. Okay. That's angry? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good enough. All right. Okay, so... Uh, so you're seeing consistent patterns Correct. because it's all being redirected to you, mm -hmm. basically, for, mm -hmm. for authentication mm -hmm. uh, of, of attempts to get access to multiple of your tenants' Correct. systems. From the same IP address, we're using the same users. And also we see something like, for example, um, I don't know, John Smith at this email trying to access tenants that are not even their tenant. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so then you know that they probably compromise the credentials and they're basically just trying multiple tenants, right. right? And so we look at all of those things and the nice thing about it is that we can block one, make sure that it's that's fine and then block across multiple right. customers. Right. And we've had customers where we tell them, we said, you know, I think somebody's trying to attack you in this way. And they say like, oh yeah, we've seen them again. You're like, should we block them? And then we block them or they can block them. And of course, I mean, I'm not, Security is a continuum thing, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we can never say that we are like 100% like secure. That actually doesn't exist. But it's a continuum of things that you can do right. to basically block the things that you know and the patterns that you understand. And we've seen like, seriously, we've seen like interesting things. We see an attacker doing something, we block them, and then the next day they come with a different strategy. And the next yeah. thing, I mean, because long are the days where you would have script kiddies using the same user agent from the same IP right. address right. and the same user and yeah, password, so right? So it's if, like if you can with complex. a marker, tell me about some of the more interesting, I mean, I think Tor is probably a big thing that helps with that, like just yep. being able to route yourself all over the world. Well, we also look at third parties that gives us reputation data, right? 
So basically, uh, okay. when you go to an IP address, we can say, oh, no, this is a bad, a bad, uh, a known um, hacker, and they will basically get the reputation and say, you know, yeah, we probably want to block them from our customers, or we actually yeah. provide those facilities to the customer. We say, you know what, you want to use reputation data and maybe kind of do different things if, if you detect that. Or we actually allow customers to say, you know, just don't allow logins from high-risk countries. Mm. You can actually create like these particular countries just don't even allow connections because there's no reason why you would be getting yeah. for your specific use case right. uh, connections from all over the, the world. Right? Oh, that's a really, I mean, we, there's a pretty limited subset of places that most of our employees are exactly, doing their work. Exactly, right? so, exactly, exactly. Oh, that's really fascinating. We can also see that <laughs> one thing that was pretty funny was that at one point we thought we were being attacked because we started seeing connections from the same IP address for a number of, of tenants mm -hmm. with successful authentications. Mm. And we're like, wait, what? Like, how can you have, from the same IP address, mm -hmm. multiple tenants that are Okta customers with users that are actually able to authenticate? It was terrifying. Turns out it was Dreamforce. Because a lot of people mm. were using the networks in, a, in on Dreamforce, and then for us, we basically see that same IP address, and they were basically le legitimate users using it. But trust me, that was that was a it was a very and then the so very early days of Okta, where it was terrifying, but it was basically legitimate authentication. So we can also start looking at those patterns to see. Now this is kind of the, the extreme case, but also we see that when we can actually identify what are the IP addresses of our customers' headquarters, for example. Oh uh, yeah. Right, because yeah. we can see you know there's multiple users, same right. IP address, right. exact same similar tenant all the time. Mm -hmm. And then we do a reverse lookup and say, okay, now that's Circle CI. We, we know yeah. who you are. I tried to use a private space just so I'm not revealing anything here. But There you go. Um, so this is everyone in one place exactly. going through a single gateway, which would be the case here. We're, we're pretty distributed, so mm -hmm. it's a mix mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. And then I was starting to wonder as you were describing that, if you have spent time thinking about ways you could work with these, you know, we're a, we're a Meraki shop, for example. Right. right? And so, to give more um, information. If, if well, like the level of authentication sort of tied into there. Well, for that, we also can, can do device signatures, mm -hmm. right? We can actually not only for IP address, but basically we can react based on the, on the device signature. Oh, I see. Right? And so um, there is, again, more analysis that, that we can do because we have a ton of data. Yeah. Um, but this is, this is actually an interesting use case, which, again, talk about the difference between the on-premise world and the cloud world. In the on-premise world, typically you are here. So you're basically seeing the actual kind of netted um, IP addresses of your right, clients. Right. We can't. Right. We can't. It all comes from, from a single gateway. Yeah. So we need to get a little bit smarter and do a little bit more of like the analysis that I was telling you, number three, which is kind of like really correlate to what's going on. And, right. uh, and we have kind of done some analysis, especially for our big customers, when we kind of say, you know, we, we, we're pretty sure that this customer has like, for example, three big headquarter offices because of just because of the IP traffic that we see. Right. So where is that I can't go back and find that original drawing because there's I don't think we could fit it, but in this in this request, right? So not the not the hacker here, but when this is me. Okay. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's so helpful. Let's, let's so I sit that. down and oh you're gonna happy face. Oh there we go. Good. I'm glad that that's your perception of me. <laughs> so my request comes in, right, that initial one of the 14 arrows going back and forth. At mm -hmm. what point are you, my, my guess is the answer to this is at every point, but where are you applying these types of heuristics, like whether it's the IP address with the signature of the machine, whether you're expecting me to so authenticate the, right now? The conclusions are basically done in line, mm -hmm. right? So we have a policy engine that has to work in line as things are happening. But there is a background process that is basically creating and crunching all of those numbers. But once we make the determination, it has to be evaluated for basically right. every single authentication request. Oh, that's a really, so I, if I understand what you were just saying, I imagine you're collecting data constantly. Yep. Mm -hmm. And using that data to inform the decisions, I'm, the policy decisions I'm that we're going to make. I'm failing myself here. I'm going to draw. Yeah. Okay, so you've got information coming in, from, or maybe you do real-time lookups to this reputation provider. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, at the speed at, that we need to need to operate, there's a lot of caching going on. Yeah, I'm going to say there's a giant <laughs> database up here, right, right. full of uh, it's full of knowledge, IP addresses, and uh, and happy faces and sad faces. Okay, let's go with that. Yeah, this is good. This is bad. Right. Okay, and so you're. 
pulling in data from this reputation provider, mm -hmm. you have, you're collecting data in real time data, about where IPs are coming from, yep. mm -hmm. and you're processing that mm -hmm. somehow. Yep. And, and building a model. Right. And then, when the authentication when I come, make this request, we compare that with the model, and then we have a conclusion already, we basically right. take action, right? So you don't have to do all this calculation no, at runtime because correct. that would take a while. Exactly. There, and then you'll have to wait for like five minutes to authenticate. Right. <laughs> Which would be, that would be sad face. Exactly. That, that would, would be, be a very face. sad face. And so, you probably wouldn't be a customer <laughs> for very long. Well, we, we have remained customers. So it's been less, th less than what, however you just said, five minutes. Yes. So, so there must be some data then. There's like with this request, right, comes mm -hmm. some little packet that's maybe it's my IP, your user my, agent, my geo. Right. Oh, I guess you figure out the geo from the, the IP geo. Or we also get yeah. from the from third party services, right? And then my oh yeah, user agent, mm -hmm. um, and then probably just I'll call your username, your tenant, right? right? Because that's actually one of the nice things about about Okta. The, the architecture allows us to. We know the tenant because of the URL that you're using, mm. which means that at the tenant level, we can make a lot of determinations. Uh, right. Because that's kind of, even before you tell us who you are, we know your tenant. Or so at least the tenant that, that I'm that trying to do. authenticate against, tenant, right? So That's correct, good point. So you'd say, oh, circle CI, we can, a bunch of shady folks, let's exactly. be careful with this one, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Or because we allow customers to tweak all of that, then we can apply policies that are only applying to your specific domain. So you could say, for example, my, uh, we, we obviously we, we use we use Okta at Okta, right? Yeah. And so, for example, for me, when I uh, I'm home, my MFA is required at all times mm -hmm. because I'm outside of the corporate network. Uh, but when I'm inside of the corporate network, I could choose, you know, because you're inside the corporate network, maybe it's okay to send SMS. Yeah. But when we're outside, you have to use push notification, right? Right, because it's it's considered a little bit more secure, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, or you have to come from this particular network, otherwise we're not even gonna let you in. Got so it. you can create all of those policies and that's based on your tenant. So per the first customer. thing that you, correct. So I, just to be cloud for a second, I, like I love these kinds of descriptions because when as a software developer, you're building like your first little right. service, you're starting out, you, you think, okay, we can do, you know, we can do authentication, we'll get a username, and we'll get a bcrypt library and we'll have a password. And you think, wow, okay, Okta does that as a service. Like, yeah. So basically they just have a bigger version of that two value lookup yeah. that we do. <laughs> a table the, with two columns. Right, exactly. <laughs> and the depth of work that happens behind yeah. the scenes here is, is just it's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. I'm super interested. You said there's a bunch of microservices in the back yep. here and yep. whatever that we're not going to talk about. So yep. now maybe so we, we have can... one main one. And I mean, you know, the company was um, started basically with 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 really a lot of the a lot of, um, our founders are from Salesforce. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of kind of cloud friendly DNA yep. from the first line of the code. It was basically built highly multi tenant, cloud friendly, born in the cloud, all of that stuff. Yep. But technology has evolved. Yeah. You know, when we started, Docker was not a thing. Yeah. Right. And so as we basically add more services, we try to really evaluate the new technologies and we try to basically put them in place. Having said that, before we actually put something in production, because of everything that we talked about, we need to understand failure modes. We need to understand how reliable they are. And we mm. try not to just chase the, the latest kind of shiny object. We're really, really careful about uh, making sure that when we incorporate new technology, we have a good story around reliability and, and, and an abstraction so we can switch and all that stuff. So uh, I was going to try to draw something there, and I, I got nothing. Um, but you you talked about the reliability overall yep. and testing new technologies. Right. Are there parts of the Okta service overall that are more amenable to trying new things because they're actually less important? You know what I mean? Like yeah. we talk about this yep. notion of a critical path. Like the most important thing that yep. I can do with Okta is yep. is authenticate. Absolutely. Are, are there other places in the system that the log analysis could be done offline? Oh, okay. right. So yeah. basically, if, if you think about if you think about um, again the Octa service as well. I love these and, blue uh, clouds. I know. It's perfect. And then you have the client here, and this is authenticating. Um, so this is basically the main authentication flow. We can't touch it. Yeah. Right. If if we break that, that's bad. <laughs> that's really really bad. Right. <laughs> like a lot of people that's are million of millions yeah. of people not able to authenticate. So we treat that very, very carefully. And, and that's also the encryption and the algorithms you mentioned, Bcrypt. So there's a bunch of stuff that we need to make sure that we get right. But once the authentication happens, then we basically send that to basically our, um, a system that is just a bunch of 
um, a collection of, of log entries, if you will, and things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Any processing that we do here can be done offline. They will, will report all of the analytics that we were talking about, the heuristics, that could be done offline. Yeah. If that thing has a problem, even if it's delayed, you know, it's not gonna, you're still going to be able to authenticate, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so if we, you may not be able to see a report that has the latest information, but you still authenticate. So there are yeah. services that are not as um, critical. We also have uh, BI services, for example, that are reading this information and sending it to our customer support uh, system, for example, mm -hmm. to make sure that when you open a ticket, we know who you are and we know your authentication and even our customer support managers, they kind of know what your usage is so that they yeah. know the applications that you're using. So they can be a little bit more informed mm -hmm. about what your use case is. All of this is basically backend services that could be delayed. They are also kind of monitored, and, and so when they fail, we know about it. Yeah. But it's a very different kind and of fixable. level. Because, that, because you have async processing, so yeah. you can rerun it or, or Correct. whatever. Correct. So, Correct. so this, let, let's go here for a second, though. Mm -hmm. So this is the untouchable, untouchable. piece, yep. except I assume you have to touch it at some point. Right? Well, There's we do like, try to innovate. Right. right. So, so do you have a model for um, so as an example, when we've changed things like uh, billing systems or how yeah, we calculate yeah, yeah, bills, yeah. we'll run both systems for a while oh, that's to a good make point. sure that, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. that we're right before yep. we cut over. Yep. So do you have yep. a mechanism for being more comfortable with making changes? So in the area? first thing, not to the commercial, but of course you need continuous uh, integration, right? You need to do a lot of obviously. testing, obviously, yeah. obviously, yes, good, all good stuff. So we do have a lot, we're strong believers in, in kind of testing development, all of that good stuff. So. Having said that, as you know, that doesn't catch everything, yeah. right? You, you, um, it would be awesome if, if, if you could, but especially with a system that has highly kind of integrated, it's very, very tough. So what we do is we have a feature framework um, uh, infrastructure. So the way it works is that at the tenant level, let's say we are changing the way a specific API works that may or may not basically have anything to do with the core flow, but it could be very important, right? Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we can have that functionality in the code in production, but not enabled for, uh, for the customer. Okay. And so um, we, and we have uh, many levels of feature flags. We have feature flags that, for example, only engineering can turn on. Mm -hmm. And they are usually kind of performance improvements where mm -hmm. we're tweaking a query, where we're basically like, or no, adding an index or things like that where only specific uh, paths happen and then mm -hmm. we can turn that on and then we can turn that on for different customers or we can roll it out slowly. Mm. Then we have feature flags that are going into beta. So maybe a circle CI wants to try, try a new feature flag, uh, maybe some new functionality, maybe some changes to specific APIs that you can try. Um, and then if you're comfortable with that and that we can put in, in a preview environment, which is actually a copy of this um, which is our Octa preview. Oh, okay. That could be mm -hmm. a, basically a mirror of everything that is in the code, and you can try it out first in your preview environment. If you're comfortable, you can try a, a beta feature there. After that, we have features that are EA, or early um, access features, mm -hmm. and then customers can, we, it's okay to use them in production because we believe they have GA quality, yeah. but we just have not GA them. Yeah. And then eventually we do GA, which is when we enable it to everybody. And we'll basically do slow rollouts. So the right? early stuff is in here in this preview environment. Uh -huh. And then once you're feeling pretty good about it, I drew this feature flag as some kind of a, like it's a additional service yep. in here. Is correct, that right? Correct, so correct. this is where the engineers are saying this particular right. customer. Right. Or it's not a, ser it's not a uh, to be perfectly accurate and transparent, it's not a separate service, but it's a separate interface okay. that, that, are, that, that are customers so, support. But as something is flowing through here, right. there's some check that says, okay, for this particular customer, either the Behave tenant or the way. user, Correct. can I, and then uh -huh. you, you fork, I don't know how I'm gonna draw this, but and you fork really off into some different code, code yep. and pass through and then come back. That is correct. And, uh, and that also helps us kind of really like rolling back, mm -hmm. like if a feature costs problems, like within like, almost seconds, you can basically go back to yeah. the behavior, like, yeah. no, no, nothing yeah, to see here, move here. on, move on. And, and I assume that ties into your maniacal monitoring, where you totally. just say, you know what, this exact slice of customers mm -hmm. is failing. Yep. Clearly, that's related to this. Right, and, right. and out of curiosity, so I'm an, I'm an engineer rolling out a new feature. Mm -hmm. Am I the one who's turning it on and then saying, let's see how this goes, and I'm going to be very attentive to the metrics right. during that time so and then turn it back off. Sort of we thing. basically ask that the teams are monitoring as their features are mm -hmm. progressing, mm -hmm. but we also have release management team that is basically going through the process of releasing new oh, features, right? Okay. So the engineers are monitoring, but they're not basically, 
we have to have some separation of duties. The, yeah. the engineers are not going to be basically turning on picture flags for customers. Right. There has to become some process around right. it. But yeah, in what, what you said is accurate. Like people are maniacally looking at dashboards and alerts to make sure that things are going well in a rollout. And if it's a problem, we, we, we roll back. Perfect. Um, Anything else about your release process that's... We have uses continuous integration, of course. Um, um, you know, I think uh, there, there is one interesting thing that is slightly different for Okta than for, for, for other companies, but it's, it's very similar to, to any enterprise software company. Uh, but Okta, one of the interesting things is that we, we can't really decide what you as an end user sees. That, mm. That's for your IT admin to decide. Mm, right. Okay. So we create a completely. Let's say. Let's say um, if you have if you have uh, your dashboard, right? Your Okta dashboard that has all of your chiclets with all of the applications that you want to mm -hmm. control. Yeah. Let's say we have a new feature for you mm -hmm. um, that creates I don't know a list of frequently used apps here. Yeah. Right. That, yeah. that is going to be something that is awesome for you, right? Because mm -hmm. we believe it's going to be awesome. We actually cannot turn that on for you. Oh. Your see, admin yeah. needs to decide when right. to turn that on. And we learned that painfully <laughs> when in the early kind of early days of, of Okta, because if we change your experience, maybe your IT admin had documentation about how the experience right. should work. Yeah. And maybe they give you a booklet when you join that says, okay, this is yeah. where you click on, and this is the Okta experience or your dashboard. And suddenly when you log in, you see a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. Customers were not super happy about that. Yeah. And so because of that, we also build functionality that not necessarily may be risky, but also anytime it's gonna change the experience. We also need to protect it with feature flags as well. Right. So there are some features that customers can mm. enable, or customers where um, we will do a, a slow roll just because of this. And so the newer organizations, for example, we have the new experience, mm. but the old organizations they get to decide. They'll go, they, they get to decide, uh, or we're giving them their. Do you experience. have what's the like oldest piece of experience that people are still using? That that you there's got to be one where you're just like, when is everyone going to stop using that so we can there is finally actually, cut that code There out is of actually an old version of the login that looks yeah. very old. <laughs> yeah. But some but customers are still just, using it. Because they don't want to rewrite their internal docs. I, well, I get it. Well, that's one thing, yeah. the docs, but also there are some applications that, that use legacy kind of version of IE or legacy version of, of oh, yeah. um, that, that require the old, the old version. Right. So there is, right. There's painfully there's there's stuff that lasts very very long. It's almost like you know APIs like diamonds are forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes this user yeah. experience is also forever like diamonds. Right on. Are diamonds forever? I think they are forever. <laughs> well, thank you so much for walking me through all this. There's no problem. A, as That's I said, a lot of information. <laughs> there's a it's the kind of model that sounds so simple on the surface, yeah. and when you get into it, there's just amazing, really really interesting things happening in here. Yeah. So thanks for for diving into it so deeply and, no and helping me understand. It was a pleasure to have Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It was great. Thank you. And thanks for joining us here on Drawn Out Conversations. We'll see you next time.